Hey everyone, welcome to week 28, day 4, uh, Thursday. This is our ongoing, you're not supposed to, week. So we've been concentrating on surfaces this week, particularly on paper, because I love painting on paper. And what we've done is not prime our paper. So all that oil, all those heavy metals from our paintings uh, are gonna seep into that paper and they're gonna eventually ruin the paper. You know, the painting is gonna be eventually ruined. But that doesn't mean we can't paint. That doesn't mean we can't do amazing paintings if we decide not to prime our surface, again, particularly paper. Uh, in my experience, you can get, you know, results that you can't get at all, you know, if you decide to do things the right way. So this is wrong, you know, question mark, but it actually, you know, gets you to a place that you would never explore or conceive if you wouldn't let yourself do things in an inappropriate way, in terms of the technical way in which you would approach a painting. So, uh, this is our fourth day with our unprimed paper and we'll see how that goes. Okay, let's get started. Now, this is gonna be our fourth day on our ongoing, you're not supposed to week where we're concentrating on things that you're apparently not supposed to do. And this week we're gonna be focusing in on uh, priming or the lack thereof. <laughs> For this week, we're working on paper that is raw, which means that we haven't treated it with anything. We haven't put any hide or glue to try and seal it. Uh, and we haven't put any primer on it. We're not using acrylic gesso or we're not using a traditional chalk gesso. Uh, we're not doing any of that. So we're not sealing it and we're not then using any primer. Why would that be a problem? Because paint is actually made up of stuff that may degrade the substrate that it comes in contact with. So oil is gonna slowly degrade the fibers in your paper and all the chemical makeup of your paint, especially if it's like heavy metals, they are also going to affect the fibers in your paper. So like I said in past days, what is going to happen is a sort of accelerated version of what will happen with time. And that I think has been the most fascinating thing for me, just seeing this painting sort of transform as I'm painting it. It's something that's akin to painting in gouache or acrylic. I have somewhat more experience in gouache, but honestly, not at all. I mean, I've done what, 15 paintings in gouache, tops at most. And acrylic, maybe two, <laughs> two in over 20 years. So yeah, I don't think I can speak uh, wisely about acrylic. I understand it, but I, I don't have the experience to, to really, really speak in depth about acrylic. My experience in as far as how paint behaves while it's drying um, and how it transforms comes from, you know, yes, having done those very few acrylic paintings and also trying to execute a gouache painting where in my brain, you know, I'm inevitably going to compare it with oil paint because that's what I am. I'm an oil painter. I have forged this relationship with oil paint through time. And it's a relationship that it's not that I'm just not willing to sacrifice. It's just that I feel that there is kinship between me and oil paint. Instead of just thinking that I have to do a thousand things well, I really do feel that the constant in my life has to be feeling like I have a stronger and stronger bond as time goes by with oil paint. I really feel this connection and I feel that that's the materials I've used to attempt to comprehend nature around me. I really want to push oil paint as far as I can and I'll only give it up if I realize that for some health reason I just can't you know, work with oil paint anymore. But for now, I'm fine. For now, it's going to be oil paint. There were a lot of people saying, why don't you just use acrylic? Or why don't you just keep working with gouache? And I totally get it. And the easiest answer I can give and the most simple answer I can give is just that while those, you know, manners of working, while those techniques, while those other paints are completely fine, they are not oil paint. Paint behaves, specifically oil paint behaves in a very, very particular way that is wholly different from acrylic or gouache. I can't want, I can't yearn, 
you know, for gouache when I'm working with oils. I can't just say, oh, wow, this is behaving a little bit gouache-like, so why don't just use gouache? No, I want to see the extent of what oil paint feels like when you push it, when you kind of stretch it beyond its parameters. Why am I saying beyond its parameters? Because fundamentally what we're doing is wrong in the sense that it is causing distress on the paper. And actually, it's not only going to be on the paper. Because paper is absorbing so much of the oil, it's kind of separating paint. So you're only going to have just a little bit of oil trying to hold all that pigment together, and you can feel it. You know, in the first couple of days, I described it as this kind of mushy, muddy, earthy paint. It's almost like you're painting with, like, clay. And you can sense that it can just crumble at any moment, especially, and this is the thing, especially if you paint thickly. I tend to gravitate towards the thicker paint because I love heavy body paint. In my life, I've always loved paintings that have a lot of paint. I very perhaps ignorantly dismiss a painter like uh, Renoir, who I think it's not a great painter. I think all those people that say that Renoir is, you know, the one thing that's terrible about painting history, I think they're right. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm exaggerating. But I don't like him. And when I was younger, I didn't like him. And even now, I look at his paintings and I just, I'm not a big fan. And for some reason, for some weird reason, I just think that his paint application has a lot to do with it. It's just kind of fluffy paint. It's paint that you're kind of stretching beyond its limits. And I don't like that. I kind of associate mark making with being committed. And I've understood that it could be very thin mark making, like in a Whistler, or very thick mark making, like in a Freud. And it's still going to speak the same to me. It really is. But for some reason, I always associated thick paint with being overly committed, with you just really, really knowing exactly what you wanted to paint. So when I see a painting that has like a lot of scumbled color, maybe, um, I don't know. I don't know. I just don't connect with it. So let's agree to say that, yeah, maybe Renoir was just a genius, but I just don't feel much when I look at his paintings. And this is me, 25 years of trying to look at his paintings and just kind of beating myself into, come on, feel something, <laughs> do something, feel something, shed a tear and nothing nothing. I wish I could say there's something, but it's like complete emptiness. But this is fine. You know, sometimes we look at a painting and we just don't connect with it. And it's not about being ignorant. You can read a ton about it. You can contextualize it. You can understand that artist within his time period. You can understand her intent. You can go through all sorts of effort to try and connect with this piece. But sometimes you're not meant to. You know, sometimes you're just being honest with yourself and you just don't share something in common. And I think that's what happens with me, uh, with uh, Renoir. So, so uh, yeah, stop the picketing outside the museums and let Renoir be. But we all know he kind of sucks. Anyways, I am speaking about this difference between thick and thin paint because I've realized that I've favored a very, very thick application on these paintings, which may prove to be problematic. I think they are going to eventually, and beautifully, beautifully, crack. And to me, that's not a problem. And I want to make that abundantly clear. And I think in my Instagram posts, I've spoken about me acknowledging the sacrifice that I'm doing. I know that I am putting aside the stability and the longevity of the painting and I am favoring just pure expression and just how the painting feels. I'm willing to sacrifice everything for that moment when I see that painting in the end. Now, this is kind of strange, but I've looked at these paintings for a week now and they have changed. They have changed dramatically. The most obvious thing is that saturation is lost and it's probably mainly lost because of the oil being absorbed. And uh, value range is also being kind of compromised. Why? Simply because, again, the oil provides the paint with a broader value range. I'm not going to get really nice, velvety, transparent, super dark darks because those are gone. Again, those are being absorbed. What I get is a very compressed value scale. I'm also I'm not getting a sense of my lighter lights being present. So in some way, the palette just compresses beautifully. Again, remember, 
these are all things that I love. I don't feel any of this is bad. I'm like, hell yeah, I found a condition of painting in which naturally these beautiful things or these things that I consider beautiful are occurring. I don't have to force anything. They just happen. They just naturally happen. And I'm like, yeah, that's it. That's exactly how I wanted to paint. The paintings are not stable. Would there be a way for these paintings to be a little more stable? Yes. And what that would entail, and I'm going to cite Francis Bacon here, at least visually, which is insane when you're, <laughs> you know, trying to cite Francis Bacon or refer to Bacon when you're speaking about a painting being a little more stable, knowing that he worked on raw surfaces his entire life and knowing that Bacon was an absolute mess. Bacon actually did paintings on paper. He did oil paintings on paper, oil sketches on paper, oil studies on paper, whatever you want to call it. In my mind, study, sketch, we've talked about this. It's the same thing. It is a painting. A painting is a painting is a painting. I know its intent could be very specific, but just the nominating it, study, sometimes lessens its value. Sometimes we think, oh, it's actually a study for something else that was bigger and more committed and um, more impressive. And this was a mere study. No, 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 no. For me, those are paintings. In and of themselves, they hold their own weight. They are absolutely wonderful. And what happened in Bacon's case is that he used very thin paint. I'm not sure if he was using oil. I'm not sure if he was using oil in terps, which is probably what he was doing. I'm not sure if he was just using turpentine, if he was just using solvent and paint. But any of those three possibilities, either straight terps, a one-to-one -one ratio of terps and oil, or just oil, those are all you know, possibilities. Those are all in the realm of possibility. I'm not sure. I've tried to read about it to see if <laughs> there is something that can shine some light on, on that subject and I haven't been able to find anything. If somebody knows and would like to guide me into where, you know, I can find information about this, that would be so awesome and you guys would be so cool. But I just don't have that info. But anyways, regardless of what he was using to thin down his paint, which again, it's going to affect the uh, fibers of the paper, um, it was very, very thin paint. It was almost like uh, uh, doing a wash. Now, you would say, why not do a wash then? Why not do a watercolor, you know? Why just almost disregard everything and say, I'm imposing this caprice that I have where I just want to paint oil on paper? Because? Because I want to. You know, there's no other reason for it. In my case, I think it's the same thing. It's like, why would I jump through hoops and change techniques just so that I can work on paper? Why not just use the same thing I'm working with and, and see how it evolves, devolves, or, you know, <laughs> changes through time, just to acknowledge its nature a lot more. I think many times we avoid seeing these episodes where our materials just change because we don't want to see how fragile they are. We don't want to acknowledge the uh, fragility in them. I love spending a little bit of time. Sadly, it has to be a little bit of time with these few paintings, but even if it's a matter of days or just two weeks, where I can see them kind of slowly morph into the painting that they will be in the future. Because I do think they settle. They kind of settle into something, into this version of the painting. And that version of a painting is going to maintain itself throughout, don't ask me how long. I mean, it could be 50 years, it could be 100 years. If those paintings, if those Lutrec paintings that we saw yesterday are a good indication but they're not because, like Bacon's, they are thin. They're very, very thin. I mean, they have moments of the painting where the application is a little bit thicker, but essentially they are built up from very thin paint initially where he works out his drawing, and then he builds it up a little bit more, but not a whole ton more. Not a whole ton. I mean, some of the uh, paintings are kind of developed and form is modeled and he starts applying, you know, paint on top of paint on top of paint. But, you know, many of them are very, very quick, are very quick paintings. And they have like a, a, a thinner quality to them. Not as thin, obviously, as these Bacons, but, you know, still, you're not really asking of your paint, you know, of the paint that is left on the surface to kind of stick together. You're not asking so much of your pigment, which I think I'm asking a little bit. 
it's almost like putting clay on top of a piece of paper and you see it kind of dry, you see it become matte and dry, and suddenly it's trying to hold on to the paper and the water in the clay, let's say it's water-based clay, it's gonna help that clay, that little bit of clay, desperately grab onto the paper, but eventually that paper is gonna suck in all that water and what you're gonna be left with in the surface is dirt. And that dirt is gonna crack and it's gonna eventually fall off. It doesn't have anything to help it adhere to the paper also. So that is probably the dire future that these paintings will be heading to. I know that and I don't try to hide that either. Like I'm trying to make that perfectly clear for whomever wants to enjoy, you know, any of these paintings. And I think that if you know that and you're still like, hell yeah, I want to spend some time, whatever time I have, you know, or whatever time the painting can give me, I want to spend that time with that painting and that little bit of time is going to make me smile then that is far more important than a long-lasting, ugly painting. <laughs> so, yeah, the everlasting, horrible paintings. Painting is styrofoam, remember. That's what we're trying to avoid. <laughs> so, as a small recap of the past couple of days, I've tried to push on Monday and on Tuesday with Francisco's painting on Monday and Jonathan's painting yesterday. Jonathan, by the way, a fantastic, fantastic soul, a fantastic artist. I love painting him, by the way. What I tried to push was a little bit of saturation within a hue range. So Francisco's portrait on Monday was about these very kind of earthy, yellowy, greeny, orangey. I'm describing three hues here. I'm a disaster. But they're all kind of analogous. You know, they're all very close together. While... Um, Jonathan's painting on Tuesday was that cooler blue in the background with just a saturation of oranges and reds and pinks in the face put against a very cool light blue background. And because I was being kind of expressive with the color, I was being very bold with mark making in the sense that I was putting you know, I'm not going to say a ton of paint down. Please don't misinterpret what I'm saying. I'm not doing a 20 layer Lucian Freud painting here, but I'm putting pretty thick paint in some areas. For example, um, in Tuesday's painting, particularly in Jonathan's uh, forehead, there's a lot of paint there. There's a ton of brush strokes, a ton of paint there. So it's a beautiful, beautiful surface there. Um, but with Danny, I was trying to see if I could get something that was more kind of homogenous, a little a little bit airier, you know, because I was seeing this very clay-like uh, nature for this painting. I was like, can I do something that's a little bit softer? And Danny's absolutely perfect and beautiful for that. So I tried to do that painting with very, very small changes, very delicate changes in hue, and try to see if I could maintain kind of that feeling of three-dimensionality, of just form, but be a little bit more sensitive. And I think it worked. I think it worked really well. And for today's painting, I was like, yes, okay, let's try to see if I can just mush everything together that I've learned in the past uh, three days. And because it is me, I'm always willing to take a chance with me, particularly, and I love to do this with my contour and with the axis of my head. I've spoken about this, but I just absolutely adore when features don't have to share an axis. The axis of the eyes doesn't have to correspond to the axis of the nose. The axis of the nose doesn't have to correspond to the axis of the mouth. That doesn't have to correspond to the axis of the uh, chin. I really like to travel through the uh, portrait. It's a long winding road and I love to place my features in a way where I feel it's the most expressive. I'm willing to sacrifice that sense of unity where features would share a single axis in order to get this kind of deeper expression. And the other thing that I love to do is just play with my contour a lot. What I basically do is that if I feel something as being round or soft, I'm gonna make it really round or really soft. And if I feel something comes up to a point and feels very sharp, I'm gonna make it sharper. And I try to be faithful to the way I react to those moments. If I feel something, I'm gonna say, turn it up to 11 and say it. Because one of the things that I've always loved about image making is the fact that you're not bound by anything. We don't have this contract with nature where we have to be 
you know, loyal and faithful to nature. The only thing we have to be faithful to is to the way we see nature and we perceive nature and the feelings that arise when we are moved by nature. What I've noticed in my own work, it doesn't have to be the same for everyone that's, you know, listening, is that if I push myself when I'm moved, if I actually translate that into a sort of heightened version of what I'm feeling when I'm looking at something, then I actually get closer to understanding my perception. So again, if I say something like, oh my God, um, your lips are really big, which happens in my case. Like I feel like my, my lips are big. So I'm going to make him huge. I'm going to make him disproportionately big. And if I felt they were huge, I would make them immense. I would make them gargantuan. So if that's how I felt about them, that's what I would paint. If I feel my nose deviates a little bit, I'm going to deviate it. I'm going to make sure that when I look at my painting, there is evidence of that in my painting. So instead of, of saying, I can't be so blunt about that, I have to measure my response. I'm always like, no, I actually have to say those things as loud as I can. I have to really, really try and push it because again, those are going to be the testaments of what I felt like when I was looking at something. So it was a blast today. It's been a blast of a week. I said it on Monday. I think, you know, this is it for me. <laughs> I'm not saying like, this is the finish line. Yeah, touchdown. I'm done. You know, <laughs> like this is as far as my painting is going to go. It, but it it is a sort of landmark. It is a sort of moment that I say, wow, this is important because... I love how the painting feels. I love how the painting looks. I love how the painting is, is being able to echo what I've always wanted to achieve through painting. And I think I'm getting a lot of that when working on raw paper. So I can't be happier with the uh, results from this week. So that's going to be it for today. I'll see you guys tomorrow where we finish off this week. I don't think I'm going to do a portrait. I think I'm going to paint myself. But spoilers... I think I'm going to do a hand because I always associate my hands with a lot of what I do, obviously. But I think I'm going to paint my hand. So we'll see how that goes tomorrow. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Thank you for hanging out. Bye.